And I, on behalf of the principal, Dr. Maggie Dorn, welcome you, especially the guests, uh, here to St. Mary's College, to this third annual St. Mary's, Mary's College uh, Alumni Society lecture. And a special welcome to Gavin. The last two lectures have been given by academics from the university with an attachment to St. Mary's College. Our lecturer this evening is not an alumnus of St. Mary's College, sadly. He may well have chosen to come here had he been open to men in his day. <laughs> As is, he's an alumnus of St. Cuthbert Society. Gavin completed his undergraduate degree in psychology in 1995. He proceeded to a master's degree in counselling before gaining work experience in a medium secure psychiatric hospital working in the field of adult mental health. Having joined the prison service in 1997 as a psychologist and qualified just after the turn of the century as a chartered forensic psychologist, he progressed to head of psycho psychological services within a high security prison where he managed a wide range of psychological interventions aimed at addressing the needs of primary sexual and violent offenders and those with substance misuse treatment rights. He completed a postgraduate diploma in cognitive therapy at Newcastle University in 2005 and qualified as a registered psychotherapist specialising in cognitive therapy. His area of interest included psychological trauma and suicidal behaviours. Gavin played a leading role in the design and development of the master's programme in applied forensic psychology at York University. He became a teaching fellow there. This was at the time the only programme of study to specialise in high security forensic psychology practice. In 2007, Gavin left psychological practice, moving into the role of prison governor. He held the post of Deputy Governor of the prison in Cardiff, then went to govern HMP Dorchester, Channing's Wood in Devon, and then the Young Offenders Prison, Deerbold, which is near Barnet Castle. Gavin is currently Governor of Edwards Her Majesty's Prison Frankland, the largest high security dispersal, dispersal prison in England and Wales. Frankland encompasses one of two prisons with um, provision for dangerous and severe personality disorder units and a separation centre accommodating prisoners deemed to hold extremist beliefs and risk of radicalising others in custody. There is therefore no one better placed to give us this lecture this evening than Gavin and we are extremely fortunate and grateful to have him with us for this third St Mary's College Society and the lecture. Thank you. And the chronology you might have judged. <laughs> so it uh, means that if you happen to notice me winking at you <laughs> during the presentation, I can assure you it's because I'm trying to read, <laughs> but more likely I'm trying to read my notes. <laughs> um, I suppose um, what I'd like to just start by saying and acknowledging is that um, I suppose prison is uh, a topic that people feel quite passionate about, and rightly so. Um, it's certainly one where, when the discussion gets flowing, most people tell me, uh, after they've heard my views on the matter, that they also want a chance to run my prison, <laughs> prison service, because they would sort out all of the problems and all I would need is a couple of months off. And usually, <laughs> their solutions are both um, draconian um, and uh, very decisive. Um, I suppose also one of the other things that I'm mindful of when I'm putting this presentation together is that prisons are, I say enjoying, I put that in speech marks, we're enjoying a renaissance, aren't we, in the UK media. Most notably if anyone's caught the um, uh, Inside Prison Britain Behind Bars series on ATV. Um, and I think that type of media interest is a mixed blessing for a couple of reasons. Um, I think it does pay testament to the bravery of some of our incredible staff, but I also think it tends to sensationalise, uh, and I don't think the media portrayal of prisons has been particularly good at nuance. 
So I've tried to think about those concepts this evening and to try and think about some material to present to you that might, may possibly add some nuance to what we're trying to achieve in prisons. Um, before I do that, I just want to talk very briefly, if you'll indulge me, in uh, to talk about Franklin. Franklin Prison, I was uh, just uh, talking about earlier, uh, lies just beyond Sainsbury's at the Arneson Centre. Um, I say that because most people do not realise that we have one of the largest high security prisons in the country, um, sat just between Sainsbury's and Next. Um, <laughs> with a lovely coffee shop and coffee shop. We are part of the community, even though we have a 25-foot wall all around us. And our job now, if we're going to be a successful prison service, is to embrace the community and let the community in, not necessarily letting our prisoners out. <laughs> so, Franklin Prison was primarily designed as a high-security prison, meaning that we are able to hold Category A prisoners the definition of a Category A prisoner is a prisoner for whom escape must be made impossible because escape would pose serious risks to either the public or possibly even national security. We also hold high-risk Category A prisoners and occasionally exceptional risk Category A prisoners, of which there are a tiny handful across the United Kingdom. Franklin also holds two, uh, houses uh, two types of separation centre. One is our Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder Unit, which houses 80 of our most highly disturbed men who are suffering from usually psychopathic or other borderline or other type of personality disorder. And also we hold one of two separation centres in the country, uh, and they are primarily designed for offenders who have either committed terrorist offences and for whom there is a risk of them radicalising others, or who have committed offences in prison and we also deem to pose a significant risk of radicalising others in mainstream population. So that's what I do at the moment. Um, it's uh, a hugely enjoyable job. It's uh, not a nine to five job, uh, but it's one that um, I'm hugely privileged to do. Mostly, I think, because of the calibre of the staff that I get to work with. I get to work with some exceptional colleagues um, and uh, that, I think, is what the media portrayal of prisons does not capture adequately, in my view, that we have some incredibly talented people working in our system. Um, so, um, I suppose I, 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 I will, if I could just say something about that photograph, because um, my partner who's in the room describes this in a very particular way. Uh, the first time he saw it, he said, I think you were going to Simon the Bob that ended up looking like Lady Di. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I think it's fair to say that I did not and have not followed a traditional trajectory in terms of my career path from university to prison governor. Um, I don't know what most, people's, uh, what most people envision a prison governor to look like, or to sound like, or to behave like. It probably isn't me. Um, and I think that's a good thing, because as a modern organisation, our ability to diversify is absolutely essential to our ongoing survival. Um, but what I would say about governing is that if you end up with too homogenous a group of governors, your talent pool very quickly goes stagnant. So if you're working with people who are all from an operational background or a military background, uh, you tend to find that the thinking in the room uh, is not as diverse as if you have people from lots of different backgrounds. I came from a psychology background and I'm very often heard saying, I honestly genuinely believe I use more psychology in my role as a prison governor than I did as a forensic psychologist. Mm -hmm. Because prison governing is ultimately a people job and understanding people, how they work and, and, and how they deal with their stressors is absolutely critical in the environment that we are trying to operate in. And ultimately what we're trying to do is create an environment against all the physical odds which people can flourish and uh, progress within. And uh, I think that takes all different kinds of people. Um, so today is not about Franklin or about high security prisons, it's actually about rehabilitation. And um, the title that I wanted to capture was the concept of a journey. Um, and uh, I thought about how can I capture a journey without boring everybody absolutely rigid with half an hour of slides on history. I apologise if there's any history people in, by the way. 
Um, but I was trying to think, how can I be short and pithy and try and capture 500 years of British prison history in three minutes? So this is an experiment. You're about to witness an experiment. It will either be successful or an over uh, a resounding failure. I will know from the look on your face which. Um, but I'm going to attempt to entertain you and divert you with a three-minute history of 500 years in prison. Would anybody like to play some bets on that, if that's going to work? <laughs> so here, here is my attempt at, at a three-minute history. Do watch. Pay attention. It's quick. <laughs> How about that in three minutes? Mm -hmm. 500 years in three minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you liked it because I'm going to write that and we're getting that ready. <laughs> um, so, really, um, what I wanted to illustrate by that very, very quick chronology is that prison may well have been on a trajectory of progress. However, within that, you would have probably noticed sort of uh, cycles of to in and fro and backwards and forwards. So within the overall forward momentum of progress, that momentum, I believe, has been punctuated by cycles of repetition. And one of those that you have perhaps picked up through the narrative there is this constant flip-flopping between the imperatives of punishment and rehabilitation. Mm. And that is something that I will touch on for the remainder of this presentation. Um, so, for example, that has manifested itself in lots of different ways. Notable examples are the oscillating trend between treatment versus containment, what works versus nothing works. And I believe that that topic itself has been a subject of a lecture here prior to, to this one. 
Um, I wonder also whether the flip-flopping that we see between punishment and rehabilitation, or reform and punishment, also perhaps reflects society's own ambivalence and discomfort with certain aspects of both ends of that spectrum. And so what happens is the prison service tries to serve that uh, conflicting demand by cycling between the two polar uh, concepts. And that causes us some issues, I think, in the prison service, because we have to feel our way through uh, what society requires of, of us at any particular time in history. And I hope that the chronology uh, showed and demonstrated some of those oscillations. Moving on to how a prison governor works within that culture. Um, I learned some uh, very important lessons, I think, early on. Franklin is the fourth prison I've governed. Um, people often ask me about uh, how um, I've learned, what lessons I've learned about leadership over those four prisons. I've learned from a huge amount of mistakes. Um, I think you have to have a good run-up of three prisons before you get to be good <laughs> on the fourth one. Fortunately, I started young enough. Um, whether there's a fifth one in me, invite me back in 10 years' time, we'll find out. Um, I think what I've learned is that a prison governor, not unlike all other management roles, because I wouldn't like to delude myself in thinking that prison governing is particularly special, but unlike a lot of management roles, the role of prison governor really requires you to uh, staple your colours to the mast in terms of what your personal leadership issues, qualities, aspirations and priorities are. And then you need to communicate those really clearly and consistently if you are to run a stable prison. And I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by stable prison in a moment because it involves both staff and prisoners. Um, I think rehabilitation culture in prisons has to start with the governor. Um, and often, as an organisation, we've often are posed ourselves the question, why do prisons sometimes go from a state of uh, really good operating, so they will be operating at a really high performance level, and then they will dip so rapidly and so dramatically? And we've seen examples in the media of prisons that have run into difficulty very quickly. And as an organisation, one of the things that we have reflected upon is how a changing governor or a changing governor style can, in some senses, disproportionately shift the whole culture within a prison when you think the prison governor might be one of 900 or 950 staff. So the role is really important and I'll come to some of those qualities in a minute. So what I mean by this slide really is what I think I'm trying to get at is that in a prison we can have all the sophisticated strategies that we like. So for example, we can have a really intelligent and a receptive incentive scheme for prisoners to try and encourage the right types of behaviours from them. We can have an, uh, an excellent and well-announced rehabilitation agenda. We can, on the HR side, bearing in mind that we are responsible for staff management, we can have a superb absence management strategy. We can have a great staff care and welfare service. We can have really intelligent, responsive financial management. We can have great partnerships with the health service or with our education provider. But all of those, I would, I would suggest from my own experience, are ineffective without attending to the culture of the staff and the prisoner, first of all. And one of the things, one of the early lessons I learned is that there is a very thin, semi-permeable membrane, if you like, between the morale of the staff and the morale of the prisoners. Mm -hmm. And I believe sometimes, in my, and this is just my opinion, Sometimes prisoners will spend a lot of time thinking about how to get the culture right for prisoners by making sure all these strategies that I just talked about are spot on and seen as fair and equitable and transparent. But actually, if you do not hold the hearts and minds of your staff, then you will not convey the right culture to your prisoners. It, whether I like it or not, it is not me that personally looks after my 850 prisoners at Franklin. It is my staff. And if my staff aren't in the right place, I'm failing as a governor because I'm not providing the support and the services that I should be to my prisoners. So one of the early lessons within leadership I learned was that the membrane between staff and prisoners has to be permeated and managed properly and you need to give the right communications and messages out to your staff who will in turn look after your prisoners for you. I cannot look after the prisoners, the staff do that for me, my job is to look after my staff. And that's been the approach that I've been trying to hone really since Dearbolt and into Franklin. 
Um, I talked before about how important it is to be clear about your own personal priorities. I'm not sure if anyone has done this or whether I'm just fairly disturbed. But if you ever Google, if you ever, I have too much time on that, obviously. Um, if you ever Google, um, you know, leadership or what do I stand for, you will get an absolute plethora of management spiel around principles and concepts and management models. Um, but I think that in my particular role, you cannot focus on everything. And this is, I think, sometimes also where leadership can fail. It's really important to be discriminating about the things which you want to focus on and then communicate on. And usually you're talking about a handful of things. A handful of things within a large prison will be enough because any more than that, and you create what I call a management dog's breakfast. There's too much, it's too confusing, it's too complicated, and staff or prisoners haven't got a clue what you actually stand for. So it's about choosing a few things and then sticking to them. But that means that the few things you pick have to be really, really big hitters. And you have to decide where you stand on a whole range of potentially hazardous dilemmas. So are you going to be a um, firm or a friendly governor? There are risks at either side. It's not one is good and one is bad. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to sit on tasks and systems versus people? Again, people sounds peachy, but if you are all people and you, you, you have no process, you will quickly find yourself in hot water as well. So some of these decisions might look easy when they're written in black and white up there, but actually you have to decide where you sit on each uh, of these continua. Once you've done that, I find that if you are clear and transparent on what is important to you, it is far more likely you will bring your staff and prisoners along with you. They might not agree with you, but consistency is a very, very powerful psychological management tool. So even if somebody doesn't agree with you, they will often approve of you as long as you are consistent with the thing that they don't agree with. And in prison, that's vital. We're holding people who don't want to be there, and some of our staff actually also struggle at times with their working environment. So it's really important that you carry people through with a sense of leadership, uh, with consistency within your leadership role. So I think being declarative about what it is that you choose, not just having these things silently captured <coughs> in your mind. You know, using the old phrase, it's not what you've got, it's where you stick it. There's no point hiding your light under a bushel. If you want to put your colours to these masks, you need to be declarative about doing so. And I always remember my father, God bless him, I remember when I was 16, I was choosing my A-levels, I was going to a sixth form college, and he said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do A-level drama. He said, what do you want to do that for? I was like, oh, rubbish. He said, do you want to do physics, mate? You want to do physics? <laughs> well, you know, I'm 30 years old. I can honestly say that probably the only qualification I still use to this day is A-level drama. So I think you're all about physics. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from actually doing the work of thinking about what your moral emphasis are going to be, or what your principles are going to be, or these continua and others, they're just examples, and having decided about being declarative about it, you have, a, you, you have a powerful model that works well in prisons because transparency and clarity will ultimately lead most people to believe that you are an authentic leader. And authenticity is really important when you're not agreeing with them. So if you're going to be a controversial leader and you're going to impose things that people don't like, like for example working in the criminal justice field, be authentic. That is your best chance of holding hearts and minds while you do it. So, once you've thought about your uh, leadership model, then you can attend to your strategy. And I'm not going to talk through this slide uh, ad nauseam, but there are a couple of points that I'd like to highlight. In a sense, this is sort of like a really overly simplistic map of how a prison, a stable prison, should run and the ingredients that you need to run it in a, 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 a constructive way. Um, one point I would say is that given the ageing the, the uh, nature of our physical environment, 
We have a lot of Victorian prisons which are gradually being phased out and closed. Dorchester on the south coast is one such example. I've learned not to underestimate the uh, physical fabric of an institution and how that can interplay with staff and prisoner culture. And actually, uh, sometimes as a prison governor, you're almost tempted to put a hard hat on and go out physically and stop pipes from leaking, uh, stop bits of ceiling falling into uh, dining halls, because uh, some prisons are uh, really uh, that dilapidated. But I I'm pleased to say that as we move forward, we are starting to work much more and understand much more the impact of the physical environment. And that is a massive change that we've seen over the last five years or so. But one of the things I would like to point out is item five on the end, uh, which it says procedural. And this is absolutely critical in terms of how you manage both prisoners and staff. It's really important that your processes, whatever they might be, they might be around incentives, they might be around HR policies, that they are seen as fair and that they are seen as transparent. But more importantly, the individual has a voice in that process and that the person who is imposing those procedures is seen as impartial. And what that means is that another individual could expect the same treatment given the same set of circumstances. So there has to be a distance, I think, between the governor and the staff and the governor and the prison, I believe, in order to uh, carry out and deliver that level of procedural justice. Procedural justice has become more and more important in prisons as we realise that stability, prisoner stability, is absolutely inextricably linked to the prisoner's perception that they might not like where they are, they might not like what is happening to them, but they understand the reason why those things are happening. And that has become of critical importance to managing stable prisons. This is a really busy slide, and again, I'm not going to go through it because you can glance across it, uh, and you don't need to absorb all elements of it, other than to say that when we have looked at empirical research uh, from our uh, psychology service across the prison service, we have been able to empirically earmark, if you like, not necessarily in really statistically robust ways, but some more than others. So, for example, the relationships column in green and the fair process column in blue I think it's fair to say that empirically these two pillars have the most support in terms of the observed impact if you deliver these ingredients well. So I'm just going to focus in on those and say that within relationships what we have learned is that the skills of empathy within our staff, good communication, and I would almost, almost go as far as to say nurturance, not paternalism, but nurturance, have directly been linked to uh, stability outcomes in prisoner behaviour. So it has really caused us to take a real sea change in how we train and prepare custodial staff, prison officers in particular, for the job that they do. So whereas in the 1970s and 80s and even into the 90s, prison staff training, prison officer training was very much about security, order, control, control and restraint, physical restraint, now the emphasis is on empathy and communication skills because they are seen to be more robust than a baton or a guiding hold or a physical lock. They do the job much better. In terms of fair process, again, I'm going to repeat the concepts that I have learned are so powerful in the job. Um, ex taking the time to explain decisions that are unpopular being transparent about why you are taking those unpopular decisions and being perceived as fair, sometimes that means being perceived as slightly removed and distant actually, means that you, go, you carry a level of gravitas in terms of taking through bad decisions or negative decisions or those that are perceived as such. So over the years, they are the things that I, they're the concepts that I have learned to be most powerful. So when I go into a new prison, I'm immediately in my first day, my first week, looking to diagnose those issues. I'm attending to culture, I'm attending to transparency and fairness, but I'm mo mo most importantly, I'm attending to the membrane, I'm observing the membrane between the prisoner and the staff. What is going on within the staff culture that echoes out and parallels and mirrors within the prison culture? If your staff are uh, disgruntled, if there is a disquiet amongst your staff, you will see it. It, you will inevitably see it within your prison population.
One of the most difficult elements of setting a rehabilitation culture in prison is that all of those procedural and cultural ingredients are absolutely great in theory. We are working with some of the most disenfranchised, disengaged, unpredictable, chaotic, violent people in the country. In Franklin, for example, within the, the, the directorate I work in, which is long-term high security, we are working with the 6,000 most high-risk prisoners in the country, and that is out of a total prison population of around 87,000. So we have the most volatile 6,000 of those. And what we as an organisation have really started to grip is an understanding of how that individual's journey has led them to behave in the ways that they do. And uh, a concept which we are now through national training uh, and through local training with our custodial staff, we are trying to introduce the concept of ACEs. It's a really user-friendly, easy way to get non-specialist, you know, our prison officers, they're not psychologically trained, they're not medically trained, they have no mental health qualifications necessarily. They are ordinary people who want to work in prison environments and do a difficult job. So it's important that we think of really user-friendly concepts that, that actually have real resonance and have real utility and meaning. And we find that an ACE is a really important one. And an ACE is an experience that disrupts in some way a key developmental process which then makes that individual more vulnerable or susceptible to either criminality or disturbed personality disorders or other, some other kind of uh, mental health phenomenon. So we are trying to train our staff nationally that understanding the derailers to functional, moral and cognitive behaviour is critical. And understanding does not necessarily mean collude with, it does not mean accept pro-criminal attitudes and behaviours. It means understand to enable some kind of forward movement and some kind of change. So I just want to invite you to cast your eye over the um, empirically identified most powerful predictive ACEs that we are aware of, certainly within our population. There are ten. And if you were to just think privately for a moment, about these 10 derailers in terms of your own experience. You might find in this room that uh, some of you will be able to identify some of these attributes and identify uh, them in your own backgrounds. And some people can sustain two or three of these derailers and still actually function to a generally good level. But imagine seven, eight or nine of these, all within your background. Think about how seven or eight of these would perhaps fundamentally skew the perception of your world and the other people in your world. And I think this is where we enter the purview of the personality disorder. And we have to acknowledge that we are looking after people who certainly fit within this diagnostic category in the majority of for these ACEs. I have just summarised some real headlines there for you without going into too much detail. So there was a, a study, it's called the Welsh study of 2015, so it's relatively recent, not brilliant, but it's relatively recent, there's more work going on now. Um, it, it worked with two groups of people. It was a comparative analysis between those people who identified four or more as opposed to nil. And what it found is that those people in the former group were 14 times more likely to be a victim of violence, 15 times more likely to commit violence, and so on. So you can see there that the power of ACEs is absolutely critical to understanding how people uh, develop disturbed behavioural and cognitive repertoires. So, when we link this to some psychological theories, and I guess one of the things I enjoy doing is kind of bridging the gap between my old career and my new career. And sometimes I can't help but go back to being, I suppose now I call myself an amateur psychologist. I'm my body can't relax like those kids who don't have ACEs, so my body won't be able to repair itself properly when I get older, making it more likely I'll get cancer or heart diseases in adults. 
It hurts when my parents hurt me, but the real damage is hidden, and that damage will be with me for life. I drink and smoke. They say I'm out of control, but I'm not. It's just my way of coping with my aces. <coughs> I've been in plenty of fights, but what's wrong with that? Kids punches don't hurt half as much as when my dad hits me. I beat up a kid last week at school because he looked at me weird. Who cares? I ended up in more time out of school. Learning's not for me anyway, and the teachers don't care any more than my parents. I don't like the way anyone looks at me except my girl. She's 16 and pregnant. Just like my mum was with me. So this is where I've ended up. I've got diabetes and cancer's probably on the way. I know all these kill you, but I couldn't do without them. I've never had a proper job and I've spent time inside. I hate my kids. I hate their mum too until she left, so my kids have grown up with aces. And now my daughter had her first kid. She's 16. The course of my life was set in the wrong direction a long time ago. I know where I'm heading and sadly I know where my kids are heading too. This doesn't have to happen. A little help in childhood makes a big difference to where life takes you. When I was a baby, the nurses noticed that my mum wasn't coping and helped her and explained how important my childhood is to the rest of my life. So, with a bit of help, she coped. The police came round after next door complained about the noise from mum and dad fighting. They asked how I was feeling. I told them I was scared all the time. Mum and dad got help. The shouting got better and the hitting stopped. I even got some bedtime stories. I still had problems at school, but the teacher asked me about what was happening at home. I got help controlling my feelings. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough. I'm now married with two children and I've got a job, most of the time. I haven't repeated the same problems with my kids. We got help when being a parent got too much. Our children are ace-free and that means their kids stand a good chance of growing up ace-free as well. Almost half the people in England and Wales experienced one ace as a child and one in ten of us suffered four or more aces. If we stop aces, Millions of children would not become smokers or binge drinkers and levels of violence in adults would be cut in half. Fewer aces in childhood also means fewer adults developing diseases like cancer, heart disease and diabetes in middle age. We all need to be ace aware. Are you? Doctors, police, nurses, teachers, firefighters and most importantly parents. The more you know about aces, the more you can help stop children growing up aces in their lives. And for those of you who have already suffered aces, the more you know, the more you can help yourself and others who have suffered aces come. So just very, very finally for a minute, I want to just use this as an opportunity to publicly pay tribute to the prison staff, my staff at Franklin, but prison staff across the whole country. You'll probably see from the TV uh, serialisations that prison staff uh, deal with relentless challenge on a daily basis. It's a personally exhausting campaign to try and work with sometimes dangerous and unpredictable people. I think our job is to more than ever understand, challenge and try to change some of our most damaged and dangerous people in our society. Thank you very much for this. Yes, yeah, soon. I, I just love that ACE stuff, it's so interesting and kind of 
portrays all of that stuff in a way that's very easy to understand, so that's great. So, is it that everyone in prison has had, for example, more than five aces, or is there other stuff going on and that's just a, a subsection of prison? I think that's a really good question. I, I would be surprised if somebody without a serious personality disorder, serious history of criminality, uh, disenfranchised, uh, maybe left school very early, uh, no formal education, I'd be surprised they didn't have at least some of those aces. I suppose in my population of Franklin, I'm dealing with the very much more serious individual who are very likely to have a lot of those attributes. Uh, but it is true that there are other routes into criminality. So for example, a really interesting case, uh, a type of offence and a type of an offender that has proved really impervious to psychological rehabilitation is the fraudster and the financial criminal. These are people who operate multi-million pound fraud across continents and they may not actually have any of those uh, characteristics at all. Not educated, uh, highly functioning, uh, the professional criminal. These people choose crime for other reasons. And because those other reasons are not as clearly defined, therefore they are much more difficult to treat in a uh, psychological rehabilitation to see that great boost in life. Now, is that the only main instance of something outside of the ACS clinical background? I think within my setting, obviously when yeah. you move into secure hospitals, you're dealing with people who are perhaps suffering from psychotic illness, schizophrenia, they may well also have those ACEs, but the, the primary reason sometimes for their explosive <coughs> violence will be around delusions, hallucinations, and other kind of psychotic phenomena. So there are different pockets of offender. I would say within the mainstream criminal population, you would be hard pressed to find people who weren't experiencing those issues, or at least some of those issues. So that's very exciting that we can do something we could. Yes, absolutely. Hi, Gareth. Um, one of the other controversies actually um, was brought to mind today where there was the sentencing of the children for that horrific crime in, 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 in Ireland uh, uh, where some, some children were killed, sexually assaulted and killed a, a girl. So during one of your, um, because I'm really struck by a lot of uh, kind of what you talked about, feels like managing children, uh, if I can say it that way, that kind of, you know, encouraging good behaviour by reward systems, etc, etc. So I'm just really struck by that controversy around um, imprisoning children and, and what your views on it in, in terms of your experience of default and so on, given that, you know, we know that some of the Scandinavian countries, for example, don't do that and so on. So just, Welcome your view on that, just because it's on one of the controversies that's been around today around the penal reform system. Yeah. Um, so within our region, we have Weatherby, which will cater for what you might call children, so they are um, custody children of 13, 14, 15. Yeah. Uh, Dear Vault, where I govern, you're talking 18 to 21, you're oh, talking right. young yeah. adults. Okay. However, what's interesting is a lot of those young adults will have quite childlike characteristics and they will perhaps be seen as maybe younger than their years because of the developmental issues. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a really difficult one, isn't it? On the one hand, you say, my experience of Diabol, which wasn't children, but it was younger, and sometimes quite young adults, 17 years old, <laughs> is that if we were to put the resources into that part of the system, mm. we would have a spend to save scheme. <laughs> Because I think actually, at the age of 17, 18, they are more emollient, I think, to change. They need much more focusing on specialist services at that age, if we are going to incarcerate. If we are going to incarcerate, we need to take that seriously, we need to put provision in at that level. I think it's a better safe scheme and can work. And some studies are quite encouraging about what we can do with young people in custody. Thank you. Uh, I didn't get a um, a big vision. So I remember this people who have these terribly traumatized childhoods and now uh, you have them and you just very what they are. What are you actually doing that you think has some potential on I mean, I've got the theory, <laughs> but what are you what are you actually doing and, and, and do you think there are some successes with I believe there are some successes, but I'm certainly not going to claim 
that we have accolades that we wish to share and cut or, or even that you, you know, you could, you could just move the system a bit. I think, I think the operating <coughs> model has to be more sensitive to um, creating environments where uh, people are able to make mistakes and make decisions that emulate more what's going on outside. And I wonder if, if the prison service is making a mistake, schools, but I'm not sure I've correctly served some of the most traumatised children. Well, I wish I'd come to you for my maths qualification. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a third, yes. I'm just interested, your, your staff are obviously facing enormous challenges, and how do you go about developing and training your staff to enable them to cope with the situations that they find themselves in? Because The aim is to progress those men, they might be on a dirty protest, they might be smashing up their cell every day. They may be attempting to violently assault a member of staff every time their cell door is open. Uh, they'll be flooding their cell, they'll be banging 22 hours a day just to disrupt and annoy the other prisoners on the unit. Mm -hmm. They are seriously disenfranchised, disengaged, angry men. To talk about how what they are experiencing is manifesting in their own personal life, their professional life, and any parallel behaviours, any mirroring behaviours. For example, I know it doesn't sound very, it doesn't sound like a very sophisticated thing to say, but I do find that if you put a segregation team member for 42 hours a week in that environment, they're getting very angry. 